All right, thanks. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you about CRISM. Uh, as you know, probably things are getting pretty exciting. Um, I think everybody knows this, but just in case, uh, CRISM is a Jackson NASA collaborative mission. There's an ESA collaboration here as well. Uh, we have two instruments. Uh, our main workhorse instrument is Resolve. It's the soft X-ray spectrometer. Almost all of you included a simulation at some point in your talks for Resolve. Uh, it will do uh, 5 EV resolution over the soft X-ray band, uh, non-dispersive, so you can look at extended sources. Um, Extend will be a 40 arc minute field of view soft X-ray imager, similar to the SXI that flew on uh, Astro 2 and uh, Hitomi. Uh, scheduled for launch, I actually should have updated the slide. We actually have a launch date now of August 26th. You'll see that in a few slides. Uh, the mission is to recover the science that was lost with the demise of Hitomi. Um, and I, again, I don't think I need to explain to this room that uh, Hitomi was obviously a monumental loss. Uh, but prior to day 38, it had been working perfectly. Uh, it was exceeding requirements in every, uh, every aspect. Uh, and even with only a few weeks of observations, we weren't even fully calibrated, turned on yet. Uh, we got over a dozen scientific papers. Uh, so we got a brief glimpse into the power of high-resolution X-ray spectroscopy. And as we've seen, uh, this really represents a tra transformative leap forward. So I think everyone has probably seen this spectrum. This is the Perseus spectrum from Hitomi. Uh, obviously, the Hitomi data is the white uh, data points. The red dashed line is the previous best spectrum we had of Perseus from Suzaku. So dial up the spectral resolution by about two orders of magnitude, and you start to actually do spectroscopy. So I'm not going to talk too much about the science of CRISM because you all have done a great job of that over the past three days. I'll just sort of tell you more about what's happening uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, so back in 2019, just before COVID hit, uh, we at Goddard delivered the calorimeter spectrometer insert uh, to Japan. Uh, we wrote a science white paper uh, for CRISM. Uh, those of you who are around for Hitomi might remember there was a series of white papers for Astro H. Uh, we decided not to do a whole series again, but just sort of to do one paper that would summarize a lot of that and, of course, refer back to the previous uh, white papers. Uh, we selected the targets for the first six months of the mission, which is the performance verification phase back in February of 2021. Um, initially, those are proprietary to the science team, but those will all eventually go completely public. Uh, we delivered the X-ray mirror assembly in the fall of 2022. We actually delivered two identical X-ray mirror assemblies. Uh, I have some pictures later of the hardware. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have a launch date now, uh, August 26th in Japan, uh, August 25th if you're in the U.S., uh, very early morning if you're in Europe. Um, but I encourage you, if you're in the U.S. and it's convenient, you should host a launch party at your institution because it'll be 8.30 p.m. on the East Coast, 5.30 p.m. if you're out West. Uh, and it'll be, as I'll as show later, it'll, it'll be a pinpoint launch. So it'll either happen or it won't. You won't have to wait around till midnight waiting to know if it actually goes up or not. Uh, this is the white paper. You can find this on ADS pretty easily. Uh, it's about 25 pages or so. just covers... Uh, sort of the general science that we'll do with a lot of references to other works if you want to go dig deeper. So here we are. This is a picture taken from Scuba Space Center, which is where the integration and testing was done. Uh, we are no longer at Scuba. Oh, sorry, I forgot to have this. We got a nice VIP visit back in February. Uh, the NASA administrator and deputy administrator went to Japan for a series of bilateral talks, and on the way they stopped by Scuba. Uh, put on their bunny suits and hats and went inside the clean room. So we've got the JAXA president, uh, the director general of ISAS, and the administrator and deputy administrator of NASA taking a, a selfie in front of the uh, the telescope. Um, as I said, we're no longer at SCUBA. Uh, we shipped out on March 15th. You can see an image on the right there of it uh, coming off of the boat. So you put it on a truck, they drove it to a port, and then shipped it down the coast of Japan to Tanagashima Space Center. At this time, we still thought we were launching in May. Um, completely unrelated to CRISM, we were ready to launch in May. JAXA had an unrelated rocket failure for a different rocket than the one we're launching on, but that kind of grounds the entire fleet when that happens. So here we are uh, at Tanegashima Space Center. Uh, we came out of the packing crate, uh, stood us upright. If you look at the image on the bottom right, that's the Resolve Dewar. Uh, it's roughly about this big around. It's about this tall or so. Uh, the detector itself is about the size of your pinky nail. So all of that machinery around it is basically part of the cooling system that gets resolved down to 50 millikelvin. Uh, I think people know this, but in case anyone's unfamiliar with how we work, resolve is a detector that is cooled down to such low temperatures that we can measure the heat of each individual photon that comes in. And we impart a few millikelvin of 
of temperature, if we're only starting at 50 millikelvin, we can measure that and back out the X-ray energy. So I always tell people when I give popular talks on this that people often think of space as being cold. The problem for CRISM is that space is way too hot. So we have to take refrigeration systems into space because 2.7 Kelvin is way too hot to detect photon energies. So we have to get down by another three orders of magnitude from the ambient temperature of space. Uh, launch, this is not a picture of us. This is a picture of Astro H. We're not yet on the pad. Um, we are on, launching on an H-2A rocket. Uh, this has been recertified for launch by JAXA following the H-3 launch failure in March. Um, we are a co-manifest with SLIM, which is a lunar mission. I don't know a lot about it, except that it stands for Smart Lander for Investigating the Moon. And, it will, and I just copied this directly from their website. SLIM will make a qualitative shift towards being able to land where we want and not just where it is easy to land, making it possible to land on planets even more resource scarce than the moon. Now, the only thing I know about SLIM is that it is part of or all of, somebody correct me if they know more than I do, uh, JAXA's contribution to the Artemis program. So it's a pretty big deal for them as well. So both CRISM and SLIM are, are very big deals. Uh, SLIM has very precise timing requirements to launch. So basically we have one second per day where we can go or not go. So again, if you're planning the launch party, like I said, you're not going to have to wait around for three hours if a countdown holds. It's, you know, if we don't go that day, we're just not going to go. Uh, best case scenario, if we delay, it could be just, you know, slip till the next day. Uh, the absolute worst case scenario, if we have to recycle the entire cryogen system, is probably about three days or so. So again, there's the time. Uh, it'll be live streamed on YouTube. I'm told that the stream will be in both Japanese and English. Um, so should be easy to find. Uh, these are our current best estimate for our performance requirements. Well, sorry, the, the requirements are in the center. The current best estimates for what we'll get uh, are on the right. These are copied exactly from Astro H's requirements. So again, our requirement for resolution is 70 V. We have every expectation to get down to five. Uh, I won't go through this line by line. The effective area, we're well above uh, any requirements. I have a plot on the next um, slide that shows this. The lifetime here, the three years or 3.5 years, that is the lifetime that we expect the liquid helium to last. That's not the lifetime of the mission because we can operate just fine in cryogen-free mode. It just costs us a little bit more operational efficiency because we have to mechanically cool all the way down to 50 millikelvin instead of getting a nice head start from liquid helium. But we have every expectation to be able to operate for as long as, you know, if the thing's operational, as long as our orbit is um, stable. So... Uh, here's the plot I mentioned of the effective area. I've put the star there for the requirements at 1 and 6 keV. So as you can see, we're well above that. Uh, and this is our current best estimate of what we think we'll see on orbit passed all the way through the system. So this is not just, you know, the XMA uh, effective area from the ground. Obviously, we'll update this once we get on orbit and actually, you know, pr produce an effective area curve. But we're pretty confident based on previous experience uh, that this is what we'll get. So obligatory slide on how COVID has impacted us on the past couple of years. Um, it was kind of a big deal. Travel was extremely limited for Goddard personnel uh, who needed to travel to Japan because this was very much a collaborative effort. We didn't just build a box and hand it to them and say, here you go. This was a combined integration effort. So we had to have personnel over there. Uh, Japan basically shut down during COVID. Foreigners were not allowed to visit. We had to go to very high levels of the Japanese government uh, to get approval for that, uh, for folks to go over. The folks who did, it was very onerous. Uh, they had to quarantine for two weeks upon entry. And by quarantine, I mean they had to stay in a Japanese hotel room for two weeks. Couldn't leave three times a day. Food was brought to the door. Um, those of us who have traveled to Japan a lot know that hotel rooms in Japan are not noted for size. So they're sort of small. Um, but anyway, the team did a really great job. Uh, we're super happy and super proud of the work that they did. Uh, there was one point where uh, the quarantine procedures were so strict that our team and the Japanese team had to work basically in separate clean rooms with a pane of glass in between them, but they put up a sign that says, welcome back. <laughs> the stuff you really wanna know, the general observer program, uh, after the commissioning and PV phase, we go into a geo phase for the rest of the mission. Um, annual calls for proposals, Simultaneously from JAXA, NASA, and ESA, uh, where, you, where you reside will determine who you propose to. And the logistics for that, if you live or work in the U.S. or Canada, you will apply to the NASA solicitation. ESA member states will go to ESA. 
uh, Japan and everyone else will go to uh, JAXA. Um, a few brief things for cycle one. Um, we're not going to allow joint observations in cycle one. This is pretty standard for uh, missions just because there's so much uncertainty with scheduling. So we'll probably incorporate that in the future, but for cycle one, no joint observations. And also no generic TOOs uh, for cycle one, just because again, we're not quite sure how the operations will work. So can't just say, you know, if a supernova goes off, I call it. Um, this slide is kind of specific to folks in the U.S., um, but if you are a U.S.-based observer uh, and you get observing time, there's, of course, funding set aside for that. We have a cycle one budget of about six and a half million dollars. Uh, half a million of that is included for laboratory astrophysics investigations. I won't go through this in detail because the call for proposals will be coming out soon. You can read all about it yourselves, but basically, if you do lab astrophysics uh, and you can come up with a way that we can support you for that amount of money, uh, even for a couple of years, uh, please do write a, a proposal for it. Future AOs, as with every mission, we anticipate this uh, annually. Uh, joint proposals are probably going to be uh, worked out over the coming years. And lastly, we're going to try to do something that we've never done before, uh, to have an early release program where we'll take a couple of observations as early on in the mission as possible and make them public before AO1 deadline so that you can see the data, you can see what's happening, you can see what the resolution is. Um, we're not going to commit just yet to exactly what that will be, uh, either what targets that will be or what exact data that would be. It may just be data products. It might not be the full event cube, but it'll be something. And I think that's my last slide. So happy to uh, take, or I guess we're doing questions in the panel discussion, but there are the websites uh, that you can go to. Anybody has a thank you? Anybody has one specific quick question you want to ask now and can't hold for the general discussion? Well, when you put it that way. <laughs> okay, then we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you again. Sure. Uh, next is going to be Matteo on the status of new Athena and what we should know about it. Yeah. So uh, I, I really want to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity of explaining you what the status of new Athena is. Uh, I fully understand that, that the status could be confusing for you in the US and for everybody of you who is not familiar with the ESA way of working. I can assure you that I am also very confused occasionally, but I shouldn't say that, otherwise my salary will not be paid for long. So the punchline of my talk is new Athena is back on track. Why do I say back? Because Athena as such is no more. Now, I leave to lawyers or to history to tell whether Athena has been cancelled, terminated, suspended, hibernated, or is one of the birds that occasionally blinds Chandra while looking novice. But the reality is that ESA suspended the industrial contract of Athena in the fall 2022. But at the same time, the science program committee of, the, of Athena, which is the board representing the member state and that essentially governs the science program of ESA, mandated the agency to study a new concept that has been christened with some lack of fantasy, new Athena. And this mission has to satisfy two conditions has to be consistent with a certain cost cap, which is essentially a 30% reduction with respect to the estimate of the cost at the time the decision of terminating Athena was taken. But still, it has to retain the characteristic of a scientifically flagship mission. Now, when we started this exercise with very strong time pressure, I can tell you not many people at ESA or elsewhere believed that this exercise could be successful. But I can announce now, it's actually already a few months old announcement, that this new concept exists. It was presented to the meeting of the SPC in March, and it has been endorsed pending programmatic consolidation. So programmatic consolidation is a jargon to say 
We just want to make sure at ESA that all of the partners, the member states and the international partners, they really can commit the money we need in order for the mission to be possible. And as far as we can tell, in fact, this money is available, but the ultimate confirmation will come only at the meeting of the SPC in November. And if this is, uh, you know, if this is happened, this happens, we will a, a be able to restart the phase A next year. So why was this miracle possible? Because essentially we have a new technical concept for the focal plane where we open the cryostat of a XIFU instrument of a microcalorimeter to space in order for the outermost vessel to be at 50K rather than a warm temperature. And this enables a set of simplification of the whole focal plane that allows a saving in cost that it has been confirmed by the inspector of a director general of ESA should be compatible with a new cost cap. So from an ESA perspective, an ESA cost perspective, this new technical concept is actually feasible and within cost. Uh, there are still a few things to be defined. So for instance, we do have still international collaboration on this mission and in particular, the preferred scenario involved NASA providing the XIFU coolers and vector plus uh, some other hardware items at spacecraft level. Uh, but the full cryostat responsibility scheme is expected to be defined by October, 2023. But one of the good uh, uh, byproducts of this simplification is that the implementation phase of the mission is expected to be shorter. Nine years as opposed to the 12 years that had been estimated for Athena at the time the mission was suspended. So what is the implication of this new concept in terms of science? Well, I don't have time to go through the whole possible science cases of the mission. This is a slide that I have purposely designed to be not intelligible and not readable, just to impress you. But this is a collection of recent results published on refereed journals on Athena on different science cases of the mission. But the reason why I'm showing this slide is just to introduce a free basic concept on what we expect the scientific performance of New Athena to be. First of all, New Athena remains a powerful X-ray mission with unprecedented combination of performance in terms of effective area, survey capability and energy resolution. And it will remain a mission operated as an open observatory as traditional for missions of the ESA science program. New Athena will retain a broad scientific scope of studying, let me read, hot gas on scales from stars to cluster of galaxies and accretion to compact matter using a large X-ray mirror and two instruments, the XFU and the WFI. And the reason why I'm reading, it's something that you shall never do, please be aware of that if you are an early career science, never, never read your slides, but I read it because this is in a quotation from the last newsletter of the head where a short article on the status of a mission was published. And the third point, which I would like to stress a lot, is that we believe that New Athena preserved almost all of the scientific objectives that had been originally defined for Athena, even if the performance will be inevitably lower due to the fact that the low, low no, a cheaper mission cannot retain the full performance of a more expensive mission. Now, some of the uh, science cases have to be readapted or redefined depending both on the new performance of the mission, but also on the evolution of the field with respect to the original proposal that was submitted in 2014. And this task is uh, the mandate of the so-called New Athena Science Redefinition Team which is a team of scientists appointed by ESA in November, 2022, and essentially to advise the energy, the agency on the science case of a new mission. And uh, this board uh, comprises 17 scientists, among them two NASA representatives. And uh, coincidentally in this picture, Rachel Austin, one of them is at the forefront. And uh, we have also in the uh, invisible on the screen, uh, Leah Corrales and they, they are, uh, to the two NASA representatives in this, uh, uh, in this board. 
Now, this board has a very specific task in this moment, which is presenting the science case of the new mission to the advisory structure of the science program of ESA, which is, as I said, the governing body of the agency, and convince the ESA advisory structure that the science case of the mission is sufficiently compelling that the mission is worth doing. And of course, that's the message that we want strongly to convey as a board. I am, together with my crew, is the co-chair of this board. If eventually we go through and phase A restarts in 2024, uh, one of the tasks of this board will be to write the new science requirement document of the mission in preparation of the industrial ITT. Now, what is the miracles? You know, why is it possible for a mission that performs less to do the same science of the mission that was designed to perform more? Well, my answer is essentially that Athena in the original design had such a revolutionary combination of capabilities, then even if you cut a little bit on the mirror size, if you change for the worse the resolution of the spectrometer, if you reduce the capability of following transient, you remain with a mission that is overcoming the performance of any existing or planned mission by a very large factor. I showed this slide already yesterday. This is a, a set of uh, figure of Mary that concerned the spectroscopic capabilities of uh, various missions, and I compare here in this plot the new Athena performance, which is the red and uh, uh, the orange curves as a function of energy from 0 to 0 0.1 to 10 kV, with Resolve, which are the green curves, and uh, the EPIC uh, TN on XMM and the RGS on XMM. And of course, you will not be surprised that in uh, most of this uh, picture, the XMM curves are almost invisible. That's, of course, a fundamental requirement for the next step of an X-ray observatory. But you can also see that with respect to Resolve, which is the obvious comparison for the spectroscopic capability of new Athena with respect to CRISM, in several of these figure of merit, we overcome the performance of CRISM by a factor that is, goes from a factor of five to about a factor of 40. So it's a mission that represents in spectroscopic terms a leap or an order of magnitude with respect to CRISP. But of course, that's not only, that's only half of the story because XIFU will provide truly IIFU, so integral field unit capabilities. And this is a picture of the Perseus cluster as images by the Chandra ACES superposed to the field of view of the XIFU. And X of the squares is one of the pixels of the XFU. And from each of these pixels, we expect to be able to extract a spectrum at a resolution, an energy resolution of between three and five, three and four EV. And uh, now this is the XFU, Athena XFU field of view. I just uh, cut here an imaginary circle to reduce uh, the field of view of the XFU to four arc minute diameter, which what we expect that the new mission will be able to deliver. And the number of pixels will be of the order of 1,500 as opposed to 3,000, but still with a pixel size on the sky of the order of five or seconds. And this plot had already been shown on the first day, I think by Claude in his, in his remarks, just to show you that the resolving power of XIFU as a size, as a function of the size of the object in the sky, is such that for objects that will be larger than 10 arc, uh, uh, seconds, uh, XIFU will deliver a much better resolving power than uh, the gratings on, on, um, on Chandra, and for uh, systems larger than one arc minutes, uh, much better than the gratings on board XMN. On terms of WFI survey capabilities, one of the key elements for the performance of the mission are the performance, the angular performance of the optics. This is a, light, a plot that represents the evolution of the performance of the optics as a function of time. And just to summarize the situation, at some point in 2022, we are capable of reaching an angular resolution very close to the requirement of five arc seconds, full width of maximum of axis. But these were module, mirror modules that were not in a flight representative configuration. We produce uh, the first module in a flight representative configuration at the end of 2022. And now you see that we are on a trend of improving against the performance, hoping uh, to reach a value very close to the requirement at the end of a development phase of the optics in, uh, at the end of 2024. In this moment, we are at the level of nine arc minutes, or, uh, sorry, nine arc seconds 
on axis uh, uh, half energy width. Now, the survey performance of a WFI are summarized in this plot. We are one order of magnitude better than any existing on planned mission in a plane of grasp versus the field of view. And the capability of the speed survey of WFI will be still five times larger than Chandra and XMM Newton. So this is the end of my, my presentation. So basic take on message is that we are there, we are back on track to restart possibly, probably phase A at the beginning of next year. And after adoption expected to be in 2027, it should follow a nine year implementation phase. And so you can make by yourself the math on when the launch day is expected to be. And I would like to stress that this is not, was not a granted achievement. It was a great achievement, but by a, a great result and a great achievement by all parties at ESA, in the member states and the international partners. And I think we should be also as a community be grateful for the enormous efforts that allows us to have new Athena back on track. Thank you. Any one quick question that's needed today, I need right now? I wonder if the name might eventually morph into Minerva. <laughs> you, read, you read my thoughts. Uh, it, it would be a very good idea, uh, but I, there are also strong, uh, and good, strong pressure and good argument to go back to the original name, because eventually the mission is by far and large the same. But is a direct decision of a director of science eventually. Okay, let's thank uh, the speaker again while uh, the next one comes up. We've heard about LEM in a number of uh, talks already during this meeting. So uh, we are glad to get a comprehensive summary. Well, I don't know in 10 minutes how comprehensive it's going to be, but I'll do my best, okay? <laughs> Circle pointer or something. Uh, the best you can do is you can use the large. Use the large mouse. Yeah. The of the cursor. Then the people on the Zoom can see it. Ah, okay. Good point. Good point. Okay. Are you keeping time or? You're doing time. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ralph Kraft. I'm a scientist at SAO, and I'm going to talk about the line emission mapper. Uh, before I get started, I would just like, on behalf of Caroline Kilborn, who's the deputy PI in the LEM team, to thank the uh, science organizing committee. Uh, for allowing me to have 10 or 12 minutes here to rant about uh, the line emission mapper. Uh, you can see the, the LEM uh, partners. Uh, let me just describe what LEM is going to do at a very high level just from this picture. These are uh, simulations, essentially the same simulation of three different uh, galaxies from the illustrious TNG simulation. This was uh, developed by Dylan Nelson. And you can see there's a very powerful active AGN outburst uh, going uh, It's in essentially three separate stages in the galaxy. And the thing that I want to point out about this picture, and I can't even see, here's the mouse, okay? You can see the disk of the galaxy is right here, and basically everything that, that Chandra and XM Newton and uh, all the other current generation observatories know about the X-ray emitting gas. This is essentially a, a density slice. It's all in the center region. With LEM, we want to look at the hot gas. We want to understand the hot gas, how it flows into the galaxy, out of the galaxy, through the galaxy, around the galaxy, uh, on, essentially uh, over a wide range of spatial scales. This is what LEM is optimized to do. Okay, so what is LEM? Let me just give you a very quick uh, overview of what it is. It's, as I said, it's designed to study faint, low surface brightness extended diffuse X-ray emission in the 0.2 to 2 keV band with calorimeter spectral resolution. So this is essentially resolution on the order of 100 to uh, 2000 over this band. And our, again, our primary science theme is this area of cosmic ecosystems. We combine a large area silicon X-ray mirror uh, with 10 arc second resolution. So uh, not high resolution imaging uh, uh, with the X-ray micro calorimeter. We have a 30 arc 30 arc minute by 30 arc minute field of view uh, with uh, one to two EV resolution. I'll describe how the resolution varies over the detector in a minute. Key things to remember, I think, is that uh, we have essentially 50 times the field of view, so more than 20 times the grasp of uh, New Athena that uh, Matteo just told, told us about. Uh, LEM is really optimized to study a very large uh, field of view region uh, with very high spectral resolution. So it's essentially XMM-like uh, imaging capability with 50 times the spectral resolution. And we're going to combine a series of deep-pointed observations plus a shallow all-sky survey as part of the directed science 
for those of you who know about the apex proposals only 30 percent of the science is for the directed science the 70 percent is going to be for the geos and i think that the capabilities of lem and the, one of the things that i want to emphasize to this audience that the capabilities of lem are going to be fantastic in all areas of x-ray astrophysics and are going to be uh, of great interest to anybody at this meeting uh, who's interested in high resolution x-ray spectroscopy okay so let me talk a little bit about the hardware so how are we going to do this uh how is this going to be implemented so the uh x-ray optic is uh uh, for LEM is the, uh, being developed at Goddard Space Flight Center by Will Zhang. It's a platinum coated silicon thin shell grazing incidence mirror with a diameter of 1.5 meters and a focal length of four meters, very fast. We require 10 arc second half power uh, angular uh, resolution. Uh, the, uh, this has already been uh, capabilities well beyond this have already been demonstrated uh, for the Star X mid X concept that Will is leading. And as you can see, there's synergy with uh, the mirror development for Star X as well as with Axis and Hexby. And uh, this technology is under, uh, undergoing a TR6 demonstration right now as we speak that uh, hopefully by uh, this time next month, this will be completed. And with one important difference, uh, this, the LEM optic is the same as the StarX optic. So this is going to be a TRL5 demonstration for the LEM optic. The focal plane is a uh, microcalorimeter spectrometer based on the uh, transition edge sensor technology. Our cryogenic chain, the Lockheed Martin, who is our industry prime, uh, is going to build the doer and the cry uh, cryo coolers. And the detectors, the focal plane assembly, the sub-50 millikelvin cooler, and the aperture filters are all going to be designed and built at Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, this is uh, The detectors are based on the uh, transition edge sensors that were developed, that are being developed for the Athena Zyfu instrument. Uh, it's the same basic sen sensor design, but the uh, critical temperature is lower, and uh, the absorbers are really optimized for uh, the, the lower energy, narrower band. And you can see here that if you look at the top figure on the, on the right, we essentially have two regions, an inner region and an outer region uh, in two different colors. The inner region, there's one absorber per TES, and in this area, we'll have one EV spectral resolution. So this is about a seven arc minute by seven arc minute region in the center. We'll have one EV. Uh, to keep the uh, electronic chain uh, doable uh, in this mission size, uh, in the uh, sort of the, the yellowish green area on the outer ring, we'll ha actually have four absorbers per TES attached by this hydro system that's sort of thermoresistively coupled so that we'll have one, one sensor and, and, and four absorbing elements. The price that we pay for that is the energy resolution there is two EV. So we have one EV resolution in the center, two EV over most of the, uh, the larger field of view. Okay, one thing I wanna highlight, you can see a comparison here of LEM with some of the other, with Chrism Resolve, for example, with, with Athena, which is the, the, this is the old Athena, the pre-reformulation Athena, and the uh, hubs, the Chinese mission hubs that I think we're gonna hear a little bit about later today. Um, you can just see a direct comparison of the capabilities of the various instrument. So the one thing I want to point out here is the huge grasp of LEM relative to CRISM and Athena. Uh, the science of the directed science part of LEM really uh, relies on having this large field of view. And the science that I'm going to talk about here uh, really can't be done by Athena uh, in any reasonable amount of time. The key point, though, that I want to emphasize at this talk is that really LEM, you know, beyond the directed science, the LEM provides transformative capabilities in all areas of the science uh, that have been discussed at this workshop. I just went through the list here. This is the list of the various sections. And so I think whether you're interested in diffuse emission, it, it, diffuse gas in emission, diffuse gas in absorption, point sources in emission, absorption, stellar astrophysics, compact binaries, uh, active galaxies, uh, out, outflows from active galaxies, LEM is going to be fantastic in all these science areas. I'm just going to show one slide here about the, the, the main directed portion of the science. Uh, the, uh, I think Irina and Anna and John uh, have already uh, talked a lot about the science, but the directed science is really uh, toward uh, understanding cosmic ecosystems, as I said, understanding how gas flows into and out and around galaxies, and it will really transform our understanding of the formation of cosmic structure. I think it's fair to say that this whole astrophysical problem of the formation of structure, why and how does the universe look the way that it does today, is one of the most important problems in modern astrophysics. And uh, I think our knowledge really, uh, if we're really going to make major advances in this area, we have to understand the hot gas, what the hot gas is doing. I mean, uh, you can see here, I've listed the uh, three areas that are essentially directly tied to the decadal. The, uh, the word key missing link in our understanding of galaxy formation and essentially the desire for a wide field of view X-ray microcalorimeter was clearly specified in the decadal. And you can see that we'll be observing targets from supernova remnants to super bubbles in our galaxies to the the galactic winds to galaxy halos, which I showed in the first uh, image, and the cosmic web. Uh, this is the filamentary structures that we can directly map in emission between the uh, more massive galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So in addition to the direct and pointed observation, we'll also do a shallow all-sky survey. Uh, we'll go to 100 se seconds depth. This will use about 10% of the total mission time. It's the first ever calorimetric survey of the whole sky. 
For the directed portion, of course, it'll allow us a very detailed map essentially along every line of sight of the uh, hot gas in, in our galaxy halo, but also the local hot bubble. But there's a tremendous amount of other science that can be done with this uh, uh, serendipitously. And I think that this is going to be a real resource for our entire community for a long time. How much time do I have left? Five minutes. Okay, I got plenty of time. So let me move into some other areas. So the LEM directed science, of course, is going to, we're going to have a, these fairly deep observations of galaxy halos, cluster outskirts, these kinds of things. And, but uh, there's going to be a lot of other structures in the field that are going to be of great interest. And I refer to this as essentially serendipitous science. That, for example, every LEM field will have thousands of AGN and will, over the course of the mission, build up this database of, of many hundreds of thousands of AGN, all at calorimeter resolution. will be very efficient, for example, at, at detecting high redshift, uh, heavily obscured AGN. But another thing that we're going to be able to do is there's going to be dozens of galaxy clusters and groups in every 30 by 30 LEM field. And LEM will be very efficient at detecting halos. We can basically uh, scan across it for a halo of a given mass. We know from the scaling relations essentially what the gas temperature is, and, uh, more or less, and uh, its it, it spatial extent. And we can uh, essentially scan through the, each LEM data cube uh, with a matched filter uh, to efficiently pick out uh, massive halos at high redshift. I'll just show a simulation of this. Hopefully the movie started here. Yeah. So Garrett Schellenberger made a movie of this. You can see it scanning through redshift here. And he's put a, uh, essentially a series of 36 halos of a mass of 13.7 uh, solar masses, M500, at a redshift of two. And you can see that they basically pop out. This is a 20 sigma detection or something, okay? And this is all serendipitous. I just want to emphasize that we get all of this for free. The key point here is that you can see, you can see the sensitivity, for example, is a function of redshift for halos of different mass. Uh, three, uh, sp 3 3G is shown here. The sensitivity goes down to a halo mass of about 10 to the 14. LEM will actually do considerably better than that. Uh, and this is all for free. This is just in these serendipitous observations in the directed portion of the science. Thank you very much. Three minutes. Okay. So uh, in terms of us understanding the, the, the cosmic evolution of baryons, uh, LEM will be fantastic. A few other areas. There were a lot of talks at this conference about stars, stellar astrophysics, uh, interest in high-resolution spectroscopy of stars. This is a Chandra observation of the Orion Nebula. This is certainly one of the, the I would say, the uh, most important uh, Chandra observations. You can see very high resolution. You can see the stars and the hot gas. The hot gas, of course, is a star-forming region. So understanding the, 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 the uh, flows of gas in the galaxy will be part of the directed portion of the science. And you might ask, well, okay, so why are the stars interesting uh, for LEM? The point here is that you can see that we'll get actually, for free, again, for free, we'll get the spectra at calorimeter resolution of hundreds or thousands of stars in the Orion Nebula. You can see an example of one there. So we can go back to the, this field over and over again if we want to understand the variability of uh, uh, the uh, X-ray corona, its impact on protoplanetary disks, all of these things that were specified in the decadal uh, in, in, in new worlds and new suns. This just falls out of our data. And of course, people can uh, will be able to propose to look at individual stars, star clusters, whatever. One other area that I would just want to mention uh, broadly for this uh, audience. LEM is, we're not positioning ourselves, we're not primarily uh, designed to be a, a time domain science mission, okay? But we will have a time domain capability. Uh, we're guaranteeing essentially a two-day uh, response time. that We want to uh, keep, the, keep the cost down for the mission operations, but, you know, depending on the timing of the compasses and the uh, arrival of the request for the TOs, I think in most cases we'll be able to get get one day turnaround and we might even be able to do a lot better than that in some individual cases. This is just one potential example of what can be done with LEM, just to show what's been sort of done with Chandra and uh, XMM Newton. This is uh, Assassin 14, 14i, LI. Uh, this is a tidal disruption event that uh, was heavily studied across the entire electromag electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you can see the light curve here on the left. And you can see very deep both uh, HETG and uh, XMM RGS spectra of this TDE, okay? And these were 500 kiloseconds each, roughly. LEM can do the same kind of thing in about 10 kiloseconds. So LEM could repeatedly go back and follow the light curve, for example, of this TDE with, uh, at very little expense uh, and get results that are, are as good or even much better if you want to go a little bit deeper than what's possible with uh, uh, the current generation of high-resolution spectrometers. Okay, so I'm just going to finish with this slide. So why are we all excited about LEM? Well, we have a bunch of reasons here. First, I wanted to just show the picture here on the left. You can see we got about 80 people to come out and brave a uh, nor'easter in uh, New England back in February to come. This is the first uh, science workshop for LEM back in February of 2023. We can see a whole bunch of people here. You can see me sitting down there in the snow pile and Caroline is uh, just off to the uh, left in this image right here, right in the front. 
so why do we think uh, why are we so excited about lem well so i've listed a few things here uh lem is i think directly responsive to decadal i would even go further to say that the in terms of this uh the our, our, our driving science for the mission i would characterize it as paradigm changing if we ever want to understand how galaxies work uh, how galaxies form and evolve okay we need to understand how this hot gas is moving in and around and out of the uh uh, the galaxy, and it re will require a mission like LEM to do the science. But I also want to emphasize that LEM has powerful new capabilities for guest observer observations, essentially in all areas of astrophysics, the enabling technologies, the uh, thin shell silicon X-ray optic and the uh, TES microcalorimeter with the hydras are now ready after decades of investment. Uh, one of the key factors here is that the uh, required mission architecture is implementable at a billion dollars. I was fairly confident of this when we started this endeavor uh, a year and a half ago, and now I am certain that this isn't the case. Uh, LEM capabilities are going to span the astrophysics community. LEM will have a great synergies with basically every facility, every major facility, uh, uh, CMB Stage 4, SKA, GMT, Roman, Athena, that's uh, likely to be operating in the 2030s. The LEM team is working hard to finish the proposal, and hopefully uh, we'll all be done on the launch pad in 2031. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Is there any one quick question? So just a quick question. Yes. Why uh, is there no high energy response in the calorimeter? Okay, that's, so the, 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 that's, it, that's a good question. It's a combination of two things. Of course, the, the mirror is optimized for the low energy, so it does have some sensitivity at higher energies, okay? But the absorbers are thin, okay? So uh, they, they will detect some of the high energy X-rays, but they also, it also saturates the pixels. The pixels are optimized for this 0.2 to 2 kV band. They'll go up a little bit higher than two, uh, but like for example, at six kV, it'll just saturate the pixel, okay? Thank you. Let's thank the speaker again okay. while the next one comes up. The next one is gonna be Randall Smith for Arcus, which is also a US uh, pro proposal. All right. All probes all the time here at the end of the uh, the session. I'd also like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to come speak, uh, which I'm doing on behalf of the entire team. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we'll start off with why Arcus. Um, it provides X-ray and UV high-resolution spectroscopy with order of magnitude improvements. So the mission that you're going to be hearing about now is a grading spectrometer, but it has both X-ray, soft X-ray, and UV grading spectroscopy. Uh, the decadal noted, and I think this is a, a quote that probably should be uh, tattooed on all of our arms, uh, in the next decade, spectroscopy will be the dominant discovery tool for astronomy, which has got to be a good message for this entire conference. Um, and <clears throat> no other mission has uh, planned this kind of high resolution in these bands. Um, now, I will note that if I talk to manager types or engineers, I sometimes get, why are you combining soft x-rays and UV? If I talk to spectroscopists, they go, of course, that's a brilliant idea. Why, you know, didn't you do that before? Um, so we got three baseline science objectives. Uh, these all come from the decadal. If you're used to proposing missions in the United States, then following the decadal slavishly is a good idea. So we have cosmic ecosystems, unveiling the drivers of galaxy growth, and worlds and sun in context. These phrases are things that you'll see lots of times in all probe mission calls. So on cosmic ecosystems, we're going to be looking at <clears throat> the outflows from AGNs. This is probably a figure that's been shown, or you, you have seen figures that look a lot like this. Looking at the acceleration of the warm absorbers, the, the UFOs, all of these things coming off of the AGN <coughs> from the supermassive black hole, the key here is that we're going to have the effective area and the resolution in order to calculate the response of the cloud to changes from the ionizing flux coming from the black hole. So you can measure the, the density of the cloud itself by using the fact that there's a time delayed response to the change in the ionization potential. There are also density diagnostic features in there. So there are lines that give you density diagnostics. The, those are useful, but it's better to have multiple ways of measuring densities because you don't always have a cloud that happens to be at exactly the right ionization potential to give you the line diagnostic that you want. 
Fortunately, the time, del the time delayed response, which requires high effective area and good resolution, works pretty much across the board. So that gives you um, <clears throat> a way of breaking this degeneracy between the density of the outflowing wind and the radius, where is the cloud? And that allows you to figure out how much power, how much momentum is going into the cloud and how much feedback is it affecting onto its host galaxy and beyond. Next one, unveiling the drivers of galaxy growth. So <clears throat> you heard in the previous talk about LEM looking at the emission from these outflows of these halos. And I think one thing that we can all agree on is knowing what's going on in those halos is vitally important. We're gonna be doing it by doing absorption line spectroscopy. So we have got sight lines to all sorts of background AGN. Um, we'll have eventually hundreds of them. And you can see here going through the, all of them going through the Milky Way halo, many of them going through the uh, M31's hot halo. And we'll be using these with measurements, not just of the soft X-ray lines, oxygen seven, oxygen eight, but also hydrogen Lyman beta and oxygen six. So we're gonna get not only the diagnostic, diagnostic hot lines of the, the hot halo, but also the warm lines to be able to see the gas that's either ionizing up or recombining back down and the hydrogen and the helium lines, not the hydrogen and helium like, but the actual hydrogen and the helium lines to know what the base is that we're measuring against. Third science case, <clears throat> this is a great mission to look at stars. Um, and um, this is not just uh, um, measuring the stars and the x-rays that we're, that uh, high energy folks are interested in doing, but we're gonna get the, the UV lines, so the oxygen, again, the oxygen six and the oxygen seven. So if you imagine an accreting young star that's that's building up, we'll be able to measure it on time scales of the accretion and the accretion changes. So we'll be able to see the gas falling in, splashing, any changes that happen. We'll also get a sample of a hundred stars, at least in the baseline science mission. And I'm certain far more from the geo science mission. <clears throat> That'll include main sequence, young stars and those hosting exoplanet transits. And in fact, one of the other major science things that we'll be doing is getting precursor data for a lot of the stars that the Habitable Worlds Observatory is planning on looking at, where they have noted that they really do need to know what the UV and X-ray spectroscopy of these stars are. Because if the star is acting up all the time and blasting your planet, it's not gonna be a really great place to be looking for uh, biomarkers, or at least we don't think it is. Um, now, what about general observer science, by the way? NASA has changed what GEO means. It is no longer guest observers. They are general observers. Just a word to the wise if you happen to find yourself talking to a NASA headquarters person. Um, Arcus will have not tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of sources that it can look at. We know now, thanks to the Rosat All Sky Survey, the SWIFT, the XMM surveys, the FUSE survey, there are over 150,000 sources where we can get excellent spectra in something like tens to at most a day's worth of uh, observing. We'll be able to get UV studies of lightly to moderately reddened sight lines. So if you're interested in looking at galactic, the galactic ISM, um, galactic dust, uh, anything, you know, understanding how our galaxy itself works, we can go far beyond what you can do today with uh, FUSE or uh, more actually today, uh, HSD costs. So, now, what else can we do? We've got time domain general observer science. Arcus will have a 24 hour uh, response for DDT and for pre-approved uh, automated sources, we can go as fast as four hours. This by the way, is one of those things when you're talking to mission planning types, they get very, very salty about just how long it takes to repoint a telescope. And as any of the Chandra folks will tell you, this is no minor, minor feat to do. So we'll have, basically two modes, one of which is a pre-approved target that goes, that bypasses the SOC entirely and goes straight to mission planning with a note saying that this target has been approved. And then ones that require waking up the PI or somebody else in order to see if it's gonna be observed, those can take a bit longer. But you can see here that that time scale actually matches a whole bunch of targets that we were likely to want to look at. Um, <clears throat> and again, you show this to manager types, and I speak from experience on this point, some of them go like, well, how are you gonna do the ones in the seconds there? Those seconds ones aren't gonna work. Well, I tell them, 
yeah, you're right. We're going to just stare at the stars that we know happen to flare, and we will catch flares. Trust us. We know which stars we're going to look at. And black hole outbursts fortunately tend to go on for some time. So when a black hole out goes into outburst, we'll just look at it until it does something interesting. So, uh, okay. So just a few, two slides here on the actual instruments themselves. The Arcus X-ray spectrometer, the Arcus XRS, um, since uh, <coughs> this used to be the name of the of resolve detector on the previous missions, but since it's no longer being used, we stole it now. So XRS now means X-ray spectrometer on, on Arcus. Uh, we use silicon pore optics. These are the same silicon pore optics that are used for Athena. And when I say the same, I mean literally the same. If they fell off the back of the truck, leaving the factory, we could take them and install them. But Mateo, you didn't hear that. Um, <clears throat> we also use critical angle transmission gratings that have been invented here at MIT. These are the, basically the successor to the HETG gratings. Um, they are almost 10 times as efficient as the HETG gratings, which is where they get their power from. And we use CCD detectors that actually have a lot of heritage from Suzaku. Um, of all places, even though they come from the uh, uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Labs. It's got a 12 to 50 angstrom bandpass with effective areas of 200 square centimeters uh, on average and a resolution greater than 2,500. We're actually targeting something like 4,000 uh, in practice, but if you're, turns out if you want to have margin, you would like to, uh, don't overpromise. That'll have about 100 times the sensitivity of the HETG at launch at Oxygen 7. Um, so this is the design, and uh, I will not skip that. The Arcus UV spectrometer, or UVS, so we have XRS and UVS, they're boring, but they're at least easy to remember, um, is a off-axis Cassegrain telescope, and I was going to include a picture of the original 1672 paper describing the Cassegrain telescope to show that we had heritage, but I only had 10 minutes for the talk. Uh, it uses a two-channel imaging spectrograph with a micro-channel plate detector, so it's all very high heritage designs. Uh, it does use a 0.6 meter uh, diameter mirror that would be coated with enhanced lithium fluoride. I don't actually know what makes it enhanced or if it's better lithium fluoride than a regular lithium fluoride, but apparently the name is ELIF, so that's what we call it. Um, this is actually very useful because although this is a small step up from what has currently been done with ELIF, the plans for the Habitable World Telescope are to make a 2.4 meter diameter mirror with this same coating. So this is a nice step in technology demonstration moving towards HWO. This will have a bandpass of basically 1,000 to 1,500 angstroms, which, as I'm sure you remember, covers basically the carbon-4, nitrogen-5, and oxygen six uh, ions, along with the uh, um, hydrogen alignment, alpha alignment, beta, uh, and some very useful helium lines as well. And as effective areas, actually, strangely enough, sort of similar to the X-ray side, um, but that ends up being about 10 times the sensitivity of fuse with a resolution greater than 17,000. So I will end uh, by going back to my opening slide and saying that uh, I think we can all agree uh, regardless of what mission we happen to be talking about today, that spectroscopy is going to be the dominant discovery tool uh, for astronomy in the next decade. And the question is simply, which mission do we think is going to be the one we can build next in order to do it? Uh, so thank you very much. Any one question for Randall? If not, there'll be the panel. Uh, thank you. Let's thank Randall again, yep. and we'll switch over to the remote truck. For hops, that uh, Junji Mao is going to tell us about hops. Did you see your screen? Everything looks good. And we hear just... you just fine. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. This is Jun Jie. Uh, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the HUBS team. Uh, let me first thank the organizers for soliciting us to introduce the project. And let me also apologize that, that I could not be there in person. Okay. In the next 10 minutes or so, I will introduce you this hot universe baryon survey, the HUBS mission. As we have learned from the past three days, two or three days, that 
hot barriers are critical elements in the cosmic ecosystem from all size scales, from stars to cosmic web filaments. They are very interesting, rich of science out there, but we also know that they are actually very challenging to be detected, especially with current instruments. And there are many two ways to detect, detect them. The first one is to point our telescope toward, toward a bright background source and then try to find absorption features separate from the known galactic features. Then we can find these, these kind of hot baryons. The other way is to actually to take a 3D, three-dimensional data cube uh, of our favorite target, uh, including the sky position X and Y, as well as the energy or the wavelength space. And there in the energy space, you need to find a, 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 say a zone that in this narrow band, the hot baryons are actually dominating in signals. Then you can select this narrow band and form a narrow band imaging like this. Then with these kind of methods, you can also find the baryons outside our Milky Way. So as you can have already realized that in both these techniques, the key is to have the high resolution X-ray spectroscopy. Without those, then if this is, is, is just a blur that you will never be able to distinguish whether they are baryons nearby or far away. So uh, since 2017, actually the uh, idea of, hub, of hubs has been formed. And actually the design of the entire mission was uh, drive by two scientific goals. Uh, the first one is to uh, better understand the, the agent and stellar feedbacks, uh, feedback physics in the context of galactic ecosystem. And we, as we all know that these two important processes govern the formation and evolution of galaxies. And the, the second scientific goal is actually to probe the cosmic baryon budget. As we know, they are all there for, from the simulations, but we haven't been able to see them solidly in many cases. And of course, once we design our instrument to meet these scientific goals, then you can also use the instrument to do other things like galaxy clusters, supernova remnants, compact objects, et cetera, et cetera. And while previously I was mainly talking about uh, detection, but of course, when we are building for this kind of next generation instrument, we are not only, we want to go beyond just detection. We want to do physics. We want to learn physics, right? We want to perform plasma diagnostics using these high resolution X-ray spectroscopy to measure all kinds of things uh, accurately, including temperature, density, abundance, all kinds of velocities. We also want to know like whether these plasmas are actually in a collision ionized dominated phase, photo ionized dominated phase, whether there is a mixture of charge exchange, contamination of non-equilibrium ionization, et cetera, et cetera. So these kind of things can all be uh, enabled with uh, high resolution actually spectroscopy. And of course, I didn't uh, have much time to talk about detailed science cases. I'll just refer you to this a uh, scientific white paper of hubs just published. Uh, put up, we put it on archive uh, recently and it will be published in this journal, which is in, in China, but it's written in, in English and you should be able to read it soon. And here I just show you the design of the TS array and the, its corresponding figure of merit for the hubs mission. Uh, similar to LAM, we have two set of uh, TS arrays. And the larger grid, uh, as, you as you can see here, covers one, de one square degree in terms of field of view on the sky. It has 3,600 pixels in total. And from each pixel, you can get a high resolution actual spectra in the energy range of uh, 0.1, sorry, typo here, 0.1 to 2 keV. And you can have a delta E at two electron volts uh, around the, the 0.6 kV, this is where the oxygen line is. And of course, with this, then you can do the uh, narrowband imaging of the hot baryons, as I mentioned. And in that case, 
the figure of merit is then the effective area times the energy resolution times the field of view. And the Hubs curve is showing blue compared with other missions, including Athena, uh, of course, that was the older one, and then the uh, Quasim and the Chandra XM. At the center of the, of the detect plane, we have another set of subarrays uh, with smaller pixel sizes covering smaller field of view, but better energy resolution. So the idea is that you can also use that to point the telescope to a background bright point source, and then to study the absorption lines in emission, uh, in absorption. And there, the figure of merit has nothing to do with the field of view, just the effective area times the resolution. Blue for the central pixels, and then green for the regular pixels. And then this is compared also with other missions, then including this case, Arcus, which is very difficult to be beat uh, at a very soft energy band. Okay, and here you are looking at the preliminary design of the hubs uh, satellite. This will be the outlook with, the, of course, with the solar panel here folded, and the optics is here, and all the cooler and detector system will be down there. And this one gives you an inside view of the detector and cooling system with all kinds of radiation shielding and different stage of cooling to make sure that the TS microcarometer can be successfully operating at a temperature below 100 millikelvin. And we will be adopting the frequency domain multiplexing readout and to, to read out the signals significantly uh, in a sig significant efficient way. So with this slide, uh, I want to show you the rough timeline of the HUBS project. As I mentioned before that we uh, first have this concept of HUBS mission in, since 2017 and followed by a few international meetings, including IAU folks meeting and two HUBS workshop. And the most recent one is actually taken place a few weeks ago uh, in Beijing uh, with uh, it was actually a forum host by Easy Beijing on the detecting of missing baryons in the universe. And we are currently, in terms of technology, trying to finish the key technology development uh, under the Chinese National Space Agency by the end of this year. This is combined with the preliminary development on the CAS. This is sort of like space A in the US, but not quite because of the time duration considered together is much longer than phase A. And we are uh, we are hoping to enter the next phase, sort of something like phase B, but not quite again. There is actually no competition with other missions, just competition with ourselves. If we can meet all the requirements after finishing the preliminary design and technology completion, uh, then we can start to construct the entire satellite in 2026 or so. It takes about five years, uh, and if everything goes well, then we can expect to, uh, to launch the satellite in 2031. And with a mission lifetime of, nominal mission lifetime of five years. And here I just show you some uh, photos of the current status of some key technology developments in terms of the, uh, including the TS microcarometer, the mechanical cooling, the uh, ADR, and the, the sonographs for optics. Actually, before 2031, we actually want to put a pathfinder on the China Space Station. This will actually be a different mission called Dixie uh, for diffuse X-ray explorer. And I list uh, the key uh, specifics, uh, uh, the key parameters of Dixie compared with hubs here, so you can have a direct comparison. And for Dixie, actually, the scientific goal is different from the hubs. With hubs focusing more on the cosmic hot baryons, Dixie will only look at the Milky Way ones, the near, the local ones. And with that, we actually need a very large field of view. For Dixie, it will be 10 by 10 degrees so that you can uh, you can efficiently map out to the sky. And then there we have a smaller TS array, only 10 by 10 pixels in total. With each pixel, we get an energy resolution around six electron volts at 0.6 keV. 
which as you can see from here that six EV is uh, enough to separate the oxygen eight and oxygen seven lines, uh, which will be far, uh, far less enough uh, to resolve anything that is beyond the Milky Way uh, and which will also be weaker in terms of the intensity for the signal. And Dixie will actually have a wider energy range go up to 10 keV uh, and then a very small effective area. I remember Pat was laughing about uh, in the first day and well here it is very small again post stem size. So with this Dixie we want to we want to just fix the permanent uh, fix it on on the on, on the China Space Station. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are not, not allowed to move so that we will just follow the CSS to orbit around the Earth and around the suns to, to cover the sky in this pattern with two holes in the ecliptic poles. That meaning that the, uh, these are not observable. And, but this still covers a large fraction of the sky. If I uh, overlay the, the Eurocena map, which you can see here that we can still do uh, very interesting science, especially including diffuse soft X-ray background, galactic scale hot baryons like you will see the bubbles here, uh, especially the north one. Uh, and then you can also cover some bright supernova remnants like Cygnus loop, Vela as well. And then you can also do some uh, things about the galactic halo. Okay. With this, uh, let me conclude that we are all interested in hot baryons in the universe. And in order to do that, we want to uh, have a HUBS mission to study the focus on the cosmic hot baryons. And with this, the main observing strategy is the deep pointing mode. And then the HUBS mission, entire mission is actually designed, uh, drive, drive by two scientific goals, agents style feedback in, in the galaxy and then cosmic baryons for galaxy uh, for size beyond the galaxy. And then of course you can do other interesting science as well. Then of course, we, in order to address these goals, we need to design our hardware, including these techniques. And also I didn't have time to go this, but uh, this workshop has already mentioned it. It is also very important to have the atomic data and the plasma code ready to uh, get up to date to better interpret the data. And if everything goes well, if everything goes well, again, we can have a pathfinder in China Space Station. And with this, I will stop and happy to take any questions. Is there any one quick question on hubs? If not, uh, we are going to have plenty of uh, time to discuss more details. I'm going to ask the four people who are local to come to the front uh, and sit down. They'll just move a couple of chairs so that you are visible in the aisle. And we are going to have Junji in the background on Zoom. Okay. Yeah, you need to bring your own chair <laughs> since you stole it. I'm just going to place this microphone in front of you on the table. That should be enough to cover. Uh, if that should be enough to capture all of you, but the monitor there will check the level of sound. And if it doesn't work, it'll tell you okay. to move it around. Um, so we're going to have some audience question and audience discussion uh, to get those four people or five people warmed up. I'm going to start with a question. Uh, all your missions are slightly different, right? They have different targets, they have um, different states, but what can we, the high energy community, high energy spectroscopy community do to make those missions possible or to make those missions a success? Tell you what, I would say that for the probe missions, that is really out of the hands of the high energy community. The teams themselves are gonna make their best bet, but I think, what we perhaps could really focus on is how to make the absolute most out of PRISM and Athena. 
because I think those are places where we really have an opportunity to make the health closure. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think there's much you can do to make prison happen at this point. It's already <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not much bad in like three days, so we're, we're getting covered on that. But I'm um, certainly making the most science return out of out of prison. Uh, NASA, you know, every three years, NASA's entire astrophysics portfolio gets reviewed by a, a senior review panel that gets convened, and they look at how important are these missions to keep operating. Because in a finite budget, uh, we can't we can't build all the missions we want, and we can't keep operating all the missions that we have. But They'll look at things like how many proposals are being written, how many papers are being written by this. I have no doubt that the first few years of prison will have a lot of scientific return, but ensuring that we still are doing a lot of great science with this is what's going to enable uh, future missions to be through. Maybe I can add, add one point that's specific to APEX. This is okay with this? You talk about what the high energy community can do. I think one of the things I would say is that, uh, you know, in the short term, I don't think there's a whole lot they can do. I would agree with Randall. But, you know, once the selection is made, I think the expectation is that one of the X ray missions and one of the far air missions are going to go forward in APEX and then can be headed head to step two. I think it is important that everybody gets behind whatever the X ray mission is, whichever one is selected. This isn't a, a winner take all situation. And uh, that whichever X ray mission is selected, that they support it, you know, participate essentially, in all, you know, the science working groups and, you know, all the community endeavors really help develop the science because then it really will, it, to be honest with you, it'll be the X ray community against the far IR community. And this is a generational thing, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about the mission that, that if an X ray mission does go forward, this is going to really define our field and define our, our, our you know, all, all the science that we're going to do for probably for 20 years, really. I think. And, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't help any of us if, 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 you know, right now we're sort of in a very partisan state. I mean, I think that most people, even in this audience, have chosen the side, and I think that's fine at this stage. But I would say that I think going forward, once once the selection is made, I think it's important that we all pull together and, and really uh, try to simplify our far our mission. Okay. <laughs> so, as far as uh, New Athena is concerned, there are two ways or two time scales on which uh, the high energy community can do something. In the short term, as I mentioned, in, uh, we are in a bit of a strange situation where the definition of the science scale of the mission is not the responsibility of the wide community, but it's a responsibility of the board appointed by each of 17 scientists who essentially are advising the agency. Now, as a co-chair of this board, my attempt since the very beginning is to involve the old Athena community in the work of this board, something that ESA had not requested as a requirement, but we decided to do that. So in this moment, this board is busy to prepare a presentation for the advisory structure, as I mentioned, on the science table of the mission. In this presentation, the first version of the presentation will be given on the 16th of October. So if you believe that there is a science case in the old Athena that uh, um, deserve uh, uh, up in significantly updates uh, due to the evolution of the field, or uh, that was neglected for whatever reason in old Athena, feel free to contact me to make sure that we can arrange quickly some updated simulation that we can use in our presentation for the advisory structure, because we are in the process of deciding out of the broad uh, spectrum of science cases that New Athena will be able to address on which topics we will concentrate uh, our attention in the presentation for the advisory structure. And we want to have a presentation of the science case as ample and as balanced as possible. So we are considering not only the whole the hot and energetic universe science case, but as much as possible cases of what it used to be the observatory science case stars, exoplanets, supernova remnants. So we are really interested in the broad spectrum of the Athena science. Once the mission is back in phase A, we are back in the traditional mode of the relation of the science community with ESA. So we will resume probably with the old uh, uh, Athena community structure, with the topical panels. And at that point, the way to contribute is to join in these tonical pa topical panels work with these topical panels to refine the science case of emission. And if you are a member already of a tonical topical panels, you know, contribute to the future science case, uh, science team of the mission to improve uh, continuously the science case and also to help uh, the future science team of the mission to perform a trade-offs. Because 
as we know, during a study, at some point, a trade-off may be needed, and this trade-off must be based on scientific consideration. But in this moment, on the short term, I repeat, if there is any science case of the old Athena that you believe was neglected or was not properly treated or that deserve uh, updates, feel free to contact me now. Junji, do you want to say something too to that? It's hard to be remote and like, jump in. So feel free to speak up and then we'll be quiet whenever you want to say something. Uh, I think uh, Rob made it a very good point in terms of the problem mission that uh, we all need to get behind the X-ray one. Uh, as you might also realize that the hubs and the lamb are a bit the same. I have to say that both missions are actually require very deep pointing to study the uh, very diffuse and dim uh, hot barriers. So actually we are with only, you know, a dozen of max seconds per year. So we actually uh, don't think it's not, uh, you know, possible to have both missions because we are actually, will be focusing on different parts of the, of the sky. And then uh, it's actually perfectly okay to have both missions, even if let's assume Lamian and Hubs are both go, go. And then uh, this is what I want to add. Thank you. I would now like to take my, my PI hat off and put on my lab astro and software hat because I one of the things that I'm honestly concerned about is the high energy community does not have a lot of experience, not, not, you know, excepting the people in this room and online. Um, there's not been a whole lot of high resolution X-ray spectroscopy done, certainly not as much as been done, say, in the imaging world. And as a result, there is a lack of analysis software. There's a, the atomic data isn't as good as it could be. Um, and I know I, I'm very happy to see younger folks in this audience. My guess is you've written software. We're going to need a lot of that software made available with explanations to people how to use it. It is in all of our interests to get as many papers written on as many topics as possible, which means we need to help our fellow community members do high resolution spectral analysis in a productive and useful way. Now, you can do that a number of ways. You can make your software available. You can go tug on Brian's shirt and tell him that, you know, CRISM needs to make more funding available for uh, software analysis. Now, there is software being developed for CRISM, but we need lots of it because there's lots of different problems and lots of different ways to do things. And I mean, ISIS is probably the closest that we've had to software design specifically for high resolution spectroscopy. Specs has changed a lot in the last few years. If you haven't taken a look at it, it's worth doing. XPEC is new, but still there's a, there's a big open area there to do better. Any other comments to this or new questions you want to bring up, new points you want to bring up uh, in the audience? I'm going to go to the back, but that's further than I can throw this cube. Um, a, a comment and a question, I guess. So yeah, I, I really agree with what Randall was saying. I think that, and also Claude brought this up in his talk, that there is a high kind of potential barrier to people entering high resolution spectroscopy. So it's harder to get students excited. It's harder to get known x-ray people excited. Uh, but the payoff is huge, right? It's the physics. Like we've done many kind of easy things in astrophysics, but we really need to figure out, I don't know, like in AGN feedback, like the physics of it, not just some correlations from, from images, right? So how do we, and this is a question to, I think I, everybody here, but also our, you know, mission leaders here, how do we as a community do a better job of, you know, inviting more people to join us in, you know, appreciation of high resolution X-ray spectroscopy? Anybody in the audience wants to comment on that? If not, I'll pass it back to the front because they're standing there and can't, sitting there and can't get away. If you don't, if you don't mind, Ryan, let, let me just let, let me just give a, a very straightforward answer. Real data. Okay, if we want to get people involved, you know, Chrism, I think, is going to get you know is going to get a lot of people excited. Okay, and I think there's obviously a core group that know how fantastic Chrism is going to be, but you know, once people start seeing the data and seeing the results. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the more instruments we have, it, it, you know, it, it, we just, there hasn't been a whole lot done in this area, not near, you know, and I think CRISM is going to be uh, incredibly motivational. 
Yeah, and, and to add to that, I've actually found that when I talk to other astronomers and other wavelengths, um, it's actually easy to get them excited about spectroscopy because they've been doing this for a long time. Like, Randall, when you say, we got R of 2500, they're not like, oh my God. They're like, oh, it's welcome to the 1960s. I mean, they've been doing this for a long time. So they understand what spectroscopy uh, looks like. So we just have to figure out, um, you know, how to join what they've been doing in the spectral resolution field. But yeah, I agree with everything Ralph said. We'll have real data soon. So. And, and lots of it. And lots of it. Yeah. And I think a, a key, not issue, I think a key goal that we have to achieve as a community, and I'm echoing something that Randall was alluding to, is making sure that uh, astronomers with expertise in our wavelengths can access uh, the spectroscopic data easily. Uh, you know, spectros analysis of X-ray spectroscopic uh, data in X-rays is still a little bit, uh, you know, a niche field with lots of jargon that we still use. I think we should uh, make an effort to overcome that and make these products easily consumable by the average optical astronomer. I, I think there is still a, a, bit of, we have a bit of work to be done in this field. So I realized we are going to be competing with Charisma a little bit on that one, but um, there's actually not enough people doing Lab Astro and there's plenty of data. So if you want to get involved, just contact the Lab Astro community. There's plenty of data to be analyzed. Um, it's great training for your students. They really learn the atomic physics when they're doing it. It's also great from a detector perspective because if you use the detectors yourself, you have a much better understanding of them than if you just have this anonymous satellite uh, taking data for you. So, you know, bring your students. Yeah, I, I, I will focus on that. The If you are worried about, like, you have a student who wants to get some lab astro training, go find your nearest lab astronomer and ask them if they can come send a student for three, you know, a month, three months, six months. Trust us. I think every single one of us who has a lab would be happy to host a student. And we've got projects to do and data to analyze. Other comments on this or points? Evine has, I, I think everybody has read that on the screen except for the four people sitting in the front. <laughs> okay, Vinay uh, Keshep says, uh, following up on Randall's comment about software, Vinay suggests to go further and say that methods are also important. It's not just about software. Um, high resolution data introduces their own unique challenges. Most people don't have experience with that and their intuitions will usually fail. Um, I, I'm not sure if I personally agree with that because welcome to the 1960s, right? But uh, uh, it's certainly, yeah, some things are different. Does somebody want to say something to that or other points? I'll just make a general comment that I think our community has been a little bit slow on the machine learning and AI front. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of progress in AI, for example, in the exoplanet community. And I know we had a couple of talks about that, but uh, I think more conversations between machine learning experts, uh, the spectral code people, uh, in terms of making sure that the that the codes are doing what, what they should be, and then the data analysis piece. And if we can exploit machine learning to help us, uh, because more photons and more resolution means more lines that we don't fully understand. And so. Mind if I go? Yeah, so let me, let me, let me actually make two statements about that. The first is that when we were doing the links business, you know, this was a few years ago. One of the things that I realized when you think about the next generation of missions is that we uh, was working with Akash and John Zuhon and others simulating links observations of clusters and various things. And I realized that the, uh, for sort of any reasonably deep links observation, you'll have about 50 million photons in the background at calorimeter resolution, okay? That the data, uh, the quality of the data, and we, you know, we think about something like LEM, for example, okay, vastly exceeds, the, I mean, the information that's going to be in these, these, you know, essentially 3D data cubes uh, vastly exceeds uh, 
anything that we've been used to with HETG, LETG, Chandra, XMM, okay? I'm in violent agreement with you there. I don't want to talk too much about it other than to say I agree with you about the machine learning. With the LEM team, we have experts in machine learning and advanced algorithms, and uh, I, I think it's it's going to be critical uh, to the forward development uh, of, of, of our field because I think, you know, when you talk about all of these missions, the, the, just the, 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 the quality of the data is going to be enormous compared to what we've been used to. We are getting going to be almost where Alma is and has been for 20 years, right? Where, or 10 years, where they get resolution 100,000 and 95% of the lines are unidentified in some bands. Yeah. If I can ask a question of, because uh, I, I know a lot of the, the graybeards um, have been talking, how about, you know, what folks who are like uh, early career, you know, within say five, 10 years of PhD, are you, what do you think that you're concerned about? What do you think, you know, what what is your science going to require that you're concerned that we don't have? <laughs> um, what one problem I think is optimization. So basically, and this is also what to the comment um, that was made online. Uh, if someone who's used to filling CCD data with like five parameters puts a you know a lem like spectrum into XPEC, they're not they're not going to be able to fit it. Just that is just not possible. And I think also just we really need to move from having tools like XPEC or ISIS and specs do everything for us and just be able to you know keep up with the world of statistics, machine learning, and everything else. So so we want to have software that you know deals with the specific the specific things we have in x-rays like loading response matrices and so on and so forth having model libraries but the statistics part we have to free it up it has to be free of expect free of other software so that we can you know actually do a good job and this is i think especially important for high resolution spectra where you might need to have models that have like 100 parameters and you're just not going to be able to do it with the methods people are used to, especially people who are used to CCD data. That's what I worry about. Yeah, and if I could add to that, I, would, I completely agree with all of that. And I would also say that um, getting back to basics might be a thing that we need to do also. You know, just, just measuring line widths and, you know, line ratios might be a really interesting thing to do. If you can't, if you can't model the entire spectrum, then don't try. Um, find your nearest plasma physicist friend who has a model and say, I've measured these line ratios. What does that mean? I've measured this width. So there's a lot we can do here. So we can do advanced stuff. I agree with what you were saying earlier about AI and machine learning and all that, but also getting back to the simple stuff too. Let's not miss the low hanging fruit. Junji, you've been nodding a little bit. Doesn't mean you wanted to, I, it's hard to <laughs> interpret through, through Zoom, right? If you want to say something, please speak up, but I also don't want you to put you on the spot if you don't want to say anything. Oh, so I have nothing more to add to what Brian has said. I agree. Um, this is a minor question. Uh, going back to Lab Astro, I was actually wondering what are the best funding resources somebody wants to do lab experiment that has a collaboration but doesn't have the funding on. If somebody wants to send a student, for example, three months to a laboratory, well, what do you suggest? <laughs> so, sorry, I was having a little trouble hearing the question. It was uh, just how would we fund the project or? Yeah. Uh, what are the best funds? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's the funding stream that you wanted to work on this? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the only funding streams are either APRA um, in the U.S. or this 500K that's coming out of um, uh, the CRISM project. Uh, and we should all thank Brian for that because it um, was not it was not a gift from the gods. People had to actually argue for it. Um, and then just internal, you know, make it happen kind of money. Uh, when I was talking about sending a student or coming to visit one of the labs, what I was thinking of is basically most of the labs have some sort of funding and some sort of doing some work. And what the student could do is basically come in and often help out with something that's already going on. Um, coming to 
help set up a crystal spectrometer and make some measurements. Um, you may not get your choice of projects to work on. It may just be what the lab is working on, but you know, more hands can always help out was the kind of thing that I'm working on, thinking about. The problem is there just is not a huge amount of funding uh, for this, at least in the US. Wish there were. Is on the topic of, I would say, separation of methods. As the point of view of a PhD student, I would say that we are gravely lacking in simplicity for people who are entering in the field. If someone reads a paper on a specific method and a specific object and on a specific code that uses it, I think we would greatly benefit, like worldwide, I would say, with like one, I don't know who founds it, website with, uh, Comparison of the method that can be used for basic spectral fitting, for example, with every single spectral software available, and then the use for case examples object. If I look at the tutorial for XPEC, I have, I don't know, I think that's 25 years ago on a random emission line and nothing else. And if I want to use anything that's remotely more complicated than the basics of the basics that no one uses anymore and hasn't used for 30 years, I need to read a hundred papers to know which specific parameters of the models are physical, which changes have been done, which energy grids needs to be modified. And this is something that's not easily accessible because you need to basically be up to date with the literature. But if you're up to date with the literature, you've either spent years or you've spent years asking someone to do it for you. That is a very good point. At least it's soft, as in soft x-rays. I just want to comment on that, and I do agree with you, and maybe I can now put my specs hand and make Ella proud. <laughs> I think that what, or at least like for what we do uh, at Estron uh, and to help out students is that, for example, Ella has a course where he teaches basically specs to students. And of course, many of them, when I was teaching them, came to me, I don't understand these black box, but at the, at the same time, it actually get them started. So what I would really like to, of course, other codes are doing as, it as well, but what, for example, Yellow Depla has been doing is that he just puts up tutorials for very simple cases of how to, let's say, use CIE and how to fit the spectrum. So, of course, I agree with all the comments that have been said that maybe we need to move on also to other things, but this, for example, when I entered the field was very useful. So if we can have like people creating these simple tutorials and also people who are available, I very much appreciated always that, for example, APEC, when I needed to work with it, I could contact Adam very quickly. I got the response like within a day. And when I finally met him here, I was like, thanks, because that really helped me get going with the spectral like as with spectroscopy and with all the things that I need to catch up on, which I agree that it's a very complex thing to do as a person who enters the field. So maybe the CRISM team should start collecting on the website somewhere, because I know a lot of these tutorials exist for ISIS, for specs, for AtomDB. Yeah, so we're actually in the process of, of thinking about that now through our guest observer facility is doing tutorials like this. Um, Another thing I was, I should have mentioned this earlier when we were talking about software, but uh, within the CRISM team, we're working on a new software package called XSlide, which is X-ray spectral line identification with an E on the end. What? Explorer? Maybe Explorer. I don't know. Uh, it's basically a GUI that you'll let you load in a CRISM spectrum. Uh, we have uh, atomic databases from AtomDB and Specs and XSTAR, I think, all loaded in. Uh, it's basically a line identification to the extent that we know what lines are there. Uh, it lets you do basic fits to, you know, width and strength and stuff like that. It's not a physics-based model. It's not a it's not a fitted CIE model or an NEI model to this, but it will at least do the basics and will identify lines uh, as far as we know that they exist in the current atomic databases. So that'll be coming out. Um, we're hoping to release that early next year. I just wanted to go back to the funding real quick. Um, since this is a Chandra workshop, I feel we should probably mention that we have actually successfully submitted a lab as a proposal to the, um, I think we ended up submitting it to the archival, but originally we asked for permission to uh, submit it to the theoretical, uh, the Chandra theory um, program. Um, so that is an option. It's relatively small amounts of funding, so it doesn't fund huge, uh, huge experiments, but there's uh, a little bit of a way to get there. 
And then I believe at the NASA um, Lab Astro Workshop in Georgia, there was a discussion um, where it was said that the Einstein Fellowship people would be happy to uh, fund more Lab Astro applications. Um, they are just not getting many. One issue with that may be that they're going to fund the person, but probably not the experiment. <laughs> But for students to join other experiments, that might be a good um, way to do that. We've talked a lot about like software and data analysis and getting people in the community. Um, for the last couple of minutes of this discussion, I would suggest to get back to science cases and on um, the, the specific mission hardware, where the missions are actually a little bit different, where so far everybody has been agreeing on everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is is uh something is there somebody from the audience or online who wants to ask or pose a question somewhat in that direction i get him i'm getting out of high resolution x-ray spiscarscopy a little bit but especially for lem it seems that it's going to be also a very powerful tool to detect transient serendip serendipitously. Yep. You've talked about one side, yep. which is, you know, moving when you have a data for something else. How about publishing a knowledge system publicly? I don't know, two or three hours or one day after you've done the observation, when you detect something that needs to be published for the rest of the multi wavelengths community to see it. Yeah, that, that we've thought about that. We've been discussing that. That could easily be part of our uh, ground processing. It, we're probably not going to do something in the spacecraft just uh, again for uh cost drivers yeah. uh you know i mean we could obviously have something that would analyze the data in real time the onboard computers has you know unlimited horsepower right these days but it, it's, a, it's really a telemetry issue and a ground contact issue uh but uh yeah i mean we could easily envision something in the data system paul was shaking his head and paul is in charge of the science operations center so i i think i think this is going to happen for lem yes Thank you. So uh, a question for the team leaders, uh, apart from uh, high resolution spectroscopy and the things that is discussed in this meeting, what kind of expertise from the rest of the community and other missions do you think if they are brought to you would help your uh, missions or your planning? Theoretical observation on um that is i'd say an area that is getting connected better but is still needs more work is the general area of connecting the the giant mhd simulations the illustrious the eagle simulations to the observables and this is it's an active area. I'm not saying that there aren't people who are doing exactly that, um, but they're few and far between. And it's not so easy for non-experts to to do, you know, basically to ask the questions of, okay, if I look in that line of sight, what do I see in absorption, in emission, in this band, in that band? Um, so those people are are extremely helpful. And if I'm asking just generally, I would say, the more work we can do in order to get that more broadly available to people would be fantastic. Um, so that's just one, one immediate idea. Yes, the kind of stuff that John does. <laughs> uh, let, let me think here for a second. Mm, well, beside what... Uh... Randall has just mentioned, at least uh, in the current uh, view of the science uh, of the of the um, science program committee of ESA, it's very important to optimize the new Athena for multi messenger astrophysics. So uh, something that the old Athena science study team tried to pursue is to create a sort of more uh, uh, structured, the more regular relationship between the Athena community and the community dealing with gravitational wave, with neutrino experiments. You may know that we published, uh, you know, slightly before Athena was uh, terminated, 
a white paper on experimental astronomy discussing the synergies between Athena and the neutrino facility, gravitational wave facility. So this is surely an area where there is a push from the ESA member states and from ESA uh, to, uh, to make, to improve. And uh, I'm sure that this will be one of the activities on which uh, the new science team of, uh, of Athena will work uh, during the development of the phase A. Yeah, so th th this is actually a good question. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to think about my answer here a little bit carefully. You know, one of the things I would say is I think that the one thing that would be a really good thing to do uh, is a, just as a general rule is that there should be an open dialogue between the principals of any of these missions and uh, the principals or even people that are heavily involved with basically every facility, ground-based and space-based, that is going to, uh, you know, be be... Uh, you know, working in, in the 2030s. I mean, I think one of the key aspects, and I'll, I'll talk about APEX in, in particular, because, you know, this, this is what I'm thinking is, but, you know, I, I think that the, one of the most important aspects of, of the APEX mission, whichever goes forward, is that really has to be relevant to the, in, you know, the entire astrophysics landscape. So it has to have broad synergies with GMT, with SPT, with SKA, with basically everything. And I think that anything that, that can actually uh, enhance those, uh, connections, those bridges, um, uh, I, I think is only good. It's good for us, but it's good for them too. I think and it's good for our community. So, you know, um, let, 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 let me give you a, a just an, an example. I mean, one of the things, one of the areas where I think LEM will be fantastic in terms of synergies is going to be with CMB stage four. And, you know, I've had some, you know, discussions with some of the, as Arena will know, with some of the people at Chicago about CMB stage four, and even in just simple conversations, they're like, well, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this coming from the microwave background perspective, okay? And you're, and, I, and even, and, you know, and I'm obviously uh, totally sold on LEM already and, and it, it makes it even better. And, you know, we've had discussions with some people about Roman and some other things that uh, I think just, uh, you know, in, in my personal role as PI, I think it's important to try to make these these connections. But I think in general, everybody, I mean, I, you know, you really sit down and, and whatever, you know, if you know about, you know, Roman surveys, for example, or GW science, okay? The, these synergies exist everywhere, and I think uh, uh, just trying to enhance the dialogue, uh, you know, as you look forward to the 2030s, uh, it, 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 it is a way to really uh, maximize the return all the way around. We're almost we're almost done. I would like uh, uh, I would like to pose a question while I walk over for each of your your four or five missions. Right, one of them is very close to being launched. What's the one thing that that's the highest risk for you that we should look out for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll, we'll, I'll let you answer that first. No, start down there. <laughs> I guess I guess we should go in chronological order of who's coming up next. Um, I'm too scared to answer that question. Um, yeah, I, I, it, this question probably isn't as relevant for Prism because I think we're, you know, Barring something catastrophic happening, I, we've done a pretty good job of getting rid of all the risks. So, uh, I, yeah, I'll just punt on this question. Let the future future mission questions folks talk about this. Well, honestly, the the main risk for Athena is a worsening of the general economic situation that may have an impact on the long term sustainability of the science program of the agency. So, I think from from our perspective. The, the main risk in this moment are geopolitical, you know, technically speaking, scientifically speaking, the mission is very robust. Uh, but if some catastrophe happens for by which ESA will have much less money for the science program, honestly, we don't know to, how to solve the problem, keeping the whole science program alive. So that's essentially we are praying for no further invasion of uh, countries in Europe, if possible. Sure. Um, I think actually the, the economic situation of the U.S. I mean, a challenge, and we should appreciate NASA for doing this, keeping the APEX um, budget in the line has been a, a real challenge. There have been people who said we should cancel the entire call. So, you know, thank your local uh, NASA HQ person for keeping it there. So that would be one risk. Another one is just the um, Arcus um, works best in collaboration with lots of other missions. Um, it really 
benefits from, say, SWIFT being in orbit. It benefits from uh, having hard X-ray missions available and from other things as well. So we really need to keep a, a healthy overall uh, platform of multi-wavelength, multi-mission messenger facilities available or else the value of having any one big flagship all by itself drops off. Um, so I would say, and I'll, I'm going to guess what Ralph is going to say, there aren't any serious risks to the design of the mission itself for Arcus. Um, the technology we know how to build, but it's the surrounding environment in which it's going to operate is at, at the bigger risk. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I would actually second that, Randall. I think that the, the biggest risk actually is the potential spending, the funding profile, right? I mean, um, the availability of money. I mean, I think it's a fantastic thing that NASA has held the line on the apex. I mean, New Frontiers got delayed. New Frontiers, if you don't know, this is a billion dollar planetary mission. And there's some talk it might get put off now for three years. Uh, and so it, it, it you know, it, it, I mean, this is a big thing, right? The, the, these are big missions that got put off. The apex is still online. Uh, and on target, uh, I think the funding profile is the biggest risk. I mean, even even once we submit the proposals, uh, you know, right now we have to be on the launch pad 2031, 2032 timeframe. But that, of course, it is entirely contingent on, you know, the appropriate funding levels being available from NASA headquarters. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I think it's not just the economic situation. I think there's other, other concerns. I mean, frankly, the, the, this Mars re return mission is another thing that could eat up a lot of money. Um, and I mean, I think it's a risk. I mean, you ask about risk. I mean, technology, technical risks for LEM. I mean, I, I would agree with Randall. I mean, I don't think we can, we're confident that we can fit in a billion dollars. We know what our risks are. We have healthy margins. Okay. I mean, I, I don't think, I'm not concerned that, well, we're not going to be able to build this or that part of the, of the mission if, if, if we're funded. Okay. I think it's really sort of external risks that are, are the biggest threat to, to, to LEM personally. So. So, Jake, anyone have comment for Hux? Yeah, so for us, I think it's, uh, uh, we are also more confident in terms of hardware, but it is uh, a community that here that is even much smaller than what you have here, and uh, we are even less experienced in terms of science. So uh, that's, the same also applies to the atomic data lab astro side that we need to break, break down the walls. Uh, there are many lab facilities within China, theoretical atomic physics groups. So we need to unite them then to, to make them work together because we, we are talking about missions within uh, 10 years or so and uh, with limited manpower. And uh, we need to grow the community, not only the astro community, but also the atomic physics community here. And also to uh, lend support for facilities as well. And all, all with the, these being said, there is also not much very specific funding available for there. So we also need to need to you know fight for funding uh, in various channels to make sure that we get enough support. So that's what I want to say about hubs. Now I don't want to say, for example, Arcus PI always invests in lottery tickets anytime the payout gets over a billion dollars. So we're, we are trying other funding mechanisms. Thank you so much. Uh, we are almost at the end of the conference. I see, I, I'm glad that there were more, more ideas and more raised hands in the audience, but we'll have to cut this off because some people will have to go home. Let's thank the five panelists again for sending our questions.